thing that made me happiest about it is they didn't mention oil a single time during that three and a half hours. So it doesn't seem like it's becoming an election topic. I've been assured by all levels of government that our contracts are not subject to renegotiation. And every government official I talk to, I make sure I tell them how, uh, how disastrous it would be if they started uh, changing the terms on um, contracts uh, as far as attracting new future investment. So anyway, we're monitoring the election. Obviously, the, the, the last two elections didn't go very well. And it all comes down to the, the there will become there will be a winner and loser. There's two guys in the election. At some point, the loser has to give the concession speech, uh, which they haven't been very good at in that in uh, Kenya. So uh, um, uh, it's not coincidental that I'm here this week. Uh, I've done a two-week roadshow a week before the election and a week after the election. I think we want to kind of keep our heads down and see how it turns out. But I'd say so far everybody's optimistic that we're not going to see a repeat of the, of the possible last election. So anyway, we, we are working uh, quite well, I think, with the locals. Uh, I'm actually spending a lot of time with the, the Lucy Foundation. Um, um, we are in the cradle of civilization here where Lucy and Britanna Boy were found, and we have to make sure we, uh, we act responsibly uh, both on an ecological uh, uh, and a social uh, uh, environment. So uh, we are spending uh, uh, a lot of effort doing this, but we think this is the most essential thing we do. We call it our social lighting and dock waste. If, if the local community doesn't see benefit and doesn't want you to be there, um, you're not going to be successful in Africa. Um, regardless of whether the government gives you a production sharing agreement, if the locals can't see benefit from you being there and you don't act like a good local citizen and a good guest in their home, um, you will not be successful. So we are spending a lot of time on that, but it is a core part of our business. So again, to summarize, I think uh, Africa Oil does have the best acreage position in what is the world's hottest exploration fund, uh, which is good to see. Uh, for those of you who have stuck with us a long time, two or three years ago, you would never have been able to say this. Uh, East Africa was considered the graveyard of geologists, uh, and uh, now it's turned into the hottest exploration fund, so it's very good to see. Um, I think Gami and Twiga now de-risk the entire local chart basin. I think uh, you'll see a number of more discoveries out of the Boca Char Basin. After Tullow de-risked their Albert Grace Basin play, they had a 93% success rate in the basin. So I'm not purporting that we're going to have that just yet, give me a few more wells, but I think you're certainly going to see a success rate over 50% in that basin. Um, with the, we are going to be very active. We're going to have six rig working. I put seven to ten wells in there. I think that's a conservative number. Tullow is telling people they're going to drill 11 wells in their acreage this year, and we're drilling two wells uh, without Tullow. So it could be more than that, but uh, based on uh, experience to date, we're going to have to be better at drilling to get to that number. So that's one of the things we're working on very hard this year. Um, again, we've got a very strong balance sheet. I think we've got all the money we need this year and going into next year. Uh, at some point, we will potentially have to raise more money. I think we may be a little more opportunistic this time. Some of you might have known we have. We were offered money in early September by Pareto, and I, I probably turned it down saying that I just wanted to wait for Twiga test results that we raised at a much higher level. At the time, I said to people, you know, I've, I've never once regretted taking money, but I've always regretted not taking money. Unfortunately, that, that came through once again. So I think uh, during this year, if uh, say we hit a few wells and the market is good and our share price goes over $10, I think we may consider a, a preemptive strike uh, to, to cash up our balance sheet. So, uh, I'm not too worried about it, as I said. I think uh, there's going to be opportunities. And I think as long as we keep finding oil, um, the, the market and the funding will take care of itself. Uh, the real thing that I think is going to be the, I think if we keep finding oil in the, in the Lokachar Basin, you'll see us continuing to build value. I think the big step changes are going to be when we open new basins. If Sabisa hits, or if any of the new sub-basins hit, or even the, the Cretaceous, I think that's where you'll see the step change uh, in our share price. But otherwise, I, I, I'm hoping that each time we, we start building those volumes, and especially in the Lokachar Basin, as we get to the point where the, the market starts seeing we've got enough oil to do a development, I think we'll, we'll keep uh, increasing <coughs> shareholder value. And I think the analysts are still on board with us. The, uh, we've got 18 analysts now covering us, which is, I think, a record for a lending company. Um, we have a lot of the bigger analysts, Merrill Lynch, uh, UBS. On our website, you can find all the analysts that cover us if you want to look through them. Uh, they have a target of $11.50. And I think the, uh, uh, 
they all do about the same thing, which is they figure out what they think a barrel of oil in the ground is worth. And the range is somewhere between $5 and $10 a barrel. So I think going back to what I said about the Logan Char Basin, um, I think the worst case scenario in my mind is that all other nine basins fail and we only have the Logan Char Basin. I think that's very unlikely. I think uh, the odds are we're going to have a couple more at least uh, that work. But let's say for the sake of argument, they do fail and we only have the Logan Char Basin. As I said earlier, we think there's one to three billion barrels of oil in the Logan Char Basin. So if you take the midpoint of that, two billion, uh, we own 50% of that, that's one billion net to us. And take the low side of what the analysts think a barrel is worth, that's five billion dollars of value to us in what I consider the, the lowest possible case, which translates to twenty dollars a barrel. So again, I'm a simple geologist, uh, many of you probably know math better than I do, but twenty dollars a share uh, would be a very good result for me uh, uh, and, and I consider that to be really the low case. So. Uh, if we find new basins, I think you can start stacking those on top of each other. I think each basin is worth somewhere in that range, uh, depending on how big it is. So again, we're talking about very big numbers, um, but I think uh, you know the lending group has proven in the past that uh, uh, some of the pie in the sky numbers uh, really do come true, uh, especially if you're in a, an exploration place like this. So, um, again, a, a great group of people. Most of these guys have been with me a long time. Nick Walker is the new kid on the block. He worked with me in Malaysia. He's kind of a young, young guy that was uh, kind of aggressive and kind of annoyed me when he first started. He just he came in and took my job in Malaysia and told me how what a bad job I'd done and how I could do it better, which is not an easy thing to take. The problem is that after about six months, he proved it, he proved it to me. He saved about thirty percent off of our development cost and uh, uh, accelerated the whole development program. And I think he's 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 a good guy to add to us because. Essentially, we were a company being run by four exploration geologists and one finance guy. And exploration geologists are, are known as dreamers. Uh, Nick is a guy that's done drilling, he's done production engineering, he's done reservoir engineering, and he brings up a nice facet to us, and he's been working very well with Tello, so I think he's a good add. The other guy we added was Alex Budden, who's uh, in charge of ex external relations. Uh, he's basically doing government relations, NGO relations, media relations, and uh, he comes from a UK government background. He was the political officer in Kenya for, for three years, so he's very well connected on all levels. And I think he's done a very nice job uh, uh, with handling a lot of our external relations issues. So I'll leave it to Robert to give you a detailed explanation of the cautionary statements. But basically, it says, don't believe anything I just told you. <laughs> all right, thanks very much. <laughs> So I guess that's the second minute for a walk and some questions. No questions, everything crystal clear? No questions at all. Uh, yes, if there are no questions, there are, there is one question. Good action chair agreement, what does that mean? How do you share? Um, production sharing agreements are very interesting. They're, they're basically made particularly for oil companies because we just make too much money. So if we go into a normal tax situation, um, we, we end up taking much more than we should uh, from the host governments. So the way a production sharing agreement is, it's designed to give the government early revenue. The other thing about a tax regime is, if we went under normal tax um, uh, terms, the government would see zero income for the first eight, nine years until we've been paid back, uh, until we recovered all of our costs. So what you do in a production sharing contract is you, you start off, if you got 100 barrels of oil, um, we get 55 of those barrels to help to, to pay for our costs, and then we split the rest of it uh, for, on profit. So the government eventually will take about 65% of the profit, but because of the production sharing contract, we get to recover our costs faster. But it allows the government to, uh, to take the to take a share of the profits from day one. So worldwide, the average production sharing account contract gives 75% to the government. Um, the worst production sharing contract in the world is Abu Dhabi, where they give 93% of the profits to the government. Uh, tells you a little bit how profitable the oil business is, that 
everybody and their brother would line up to get into Abu Dhabi to take that contract with them and still give 93% to the government. So our contract is 65% government take, which is a, a, a relatively good contract, but not too good, if you know what I mean. So I think it, it, it actually is a fairly fair contract given where Kenya is and, and their reserves. And it already has clauses built in. If we do better than we think, uh, if oil prices are higher, or if we find more oil and, and produce higher rates, more of it goes to the government. So I, I think it's a very defensible contract. You don't really want too good of a contract because then I think um, you, know, you start thinking about renegotiation. So I think uh, I think it's a it's a fair fair contract, and I think uh, uh, certainly we can live with that government pay. So when you talk about the figure for uh, the next amount, you have this amount. Is that before or after the FDA is Is that? Uh, those are just raw barrels. So the, the $5 to $10 value valuation that I talked about, that includes basically uh, assuming that we give the government their share of the profits. So to, to, to evaluate a production sharing a contract and do a government take, you actually have to assume a field size, you have to assume costs, you have to assume oil price, and then you run it through the model and see what it, what it spits out. So. It's, it, it, it's different at different oil prices, different at uh, different field sizes, uh, production rates, and things like that. Why do the telecoms always the foreign market? Doesn't the market have the money to be in the company? Well, I mean, the better question is why is all resource share price going down for that? If you look, I was just in Toronto last week and everybody was suicidal. Um, the, uh, um, the, the, the small energy uh, index, small energy and mining re small resource index, is the same as it was in 2008 when uh, um, oil price was $36 a barrel. So, um, you know, we're $110 a barrel. The Dow is at, what, $14,500 record levels. And yet, Small cap energy and mining companies are, 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 are being crushed. You know, gold companies are being crushed even worse than oil companies. And uh, nobody could give me a satisfactory explanation. As I said at the beginning of our talk, we're in so much better shape than we were when we were at $11 a share. Um, and uh, you know, what I tell my guys is, you know, you can't watch the stock price every day. Keep your head down. Find more oil. You know, eventually the market will value, or a big oil company will value what we've done. But I, I, I wish I had an answer for you, but um, you know, I, I, every time I announce good news, I, uh, our share price goes down 10%. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Lucas tells me I should probably try drilling a couple of dry holes and see if maybe the opposite will happen. Uh, I think, I think the, the market today basically um, ignores good news and severely punishes bad news. And I think it's just it's just a really tough market, which again I don't really understand because the broader market is doing great, economies are um, uh, are coming back, and uh, you know to me commodities are still the, the true currency of the future. You know no matter what the U.S. dollar or the euro does, everyone's going to need oil. Everybody's going to need minerals. Um, so I can't I can't understand why smaller commodity companies are suffering as bad as they are.